He was the director of the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, for more than eight years. Louis Free, who led investigations on the Unabomber, Ruby Ridge, Waco, terror attacks on our troops overseas, the TWA explosion, and many more key investigations, was the virtual guest speaker at a major fundraising event for the Palm Beach Civic Association the other day. Questions were asked by directors and members. Here's a quick overview of that very enlightening visit. I'm delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, Louis Free. He has had a remarkable career in law as a judge in private practice, and most notably for his eight years as head as the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Plus, we are happy to report he is a part-time resident in Palm Beach. Louis, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Let me ask you a, a question, if you would. You were, an, you were an attorney by training and a judge. What, com what compelled you to pursue law enforcement as a career? Sure. Well, thank you very much, Bob and Mary, all my friends and neighbors in Palm Beach. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm delighted to be with you even in a virtual format. Um, you know, I think growing up, so I grew up in Jersey City. We were, um, you know, first generation Italian Americans on one side, German Americans on the other. Um, it was a, you know, a tough neighborhood. And when I worked uh, on the docks, uh, when I was in college, uh, you know, it was clear that uh, organized crime had had very strong uh, tentacles and ran the company, I think, more than the managers of the company did. So, you know, a combination of, uh, of those things. And I think, you know, having parents who were just very uh, uh, loyal, law-abiding Americans. My dad was a World War II veteran. Uh, it seemed like a great thing to do uh, in terms of public service. And um, at 25, I joined the FBI, which was, uh, which was a great uh, thing and a, a wonderful experience and stayed in government and law enforcement uh, for about 26 years. So probably growing up and my parents' influence and wanting to protect people, make, uh, make the community safe and trying to overcome some of the things that I saw growing up in, uh, in that time. What event, was there a single event uh, that pointed you in the direction of that, uh, that you can remember and look back on? Yeah, I guess a couple of events. So I was working on the docks one day and um, you know, all of a sudden the foreman told us to stop work. And um, then one of the other foremen brought a stepladder over to a giant oil painting of uh, Tony Provenzano. Tony Provenzano was the president of 560, which was my union. And um, all of a sudden uh, you could see that uh, the company was, uh, you know, mustering. The CEO came down to the docks with his suit on, everything stopped. And, you know, um, Mr. Provenzano uh, walked down the, uh, the dock and he didn't strike me so much as a union leader as uh, he looked more like the CEO of the company. So, you know, it was that type of uh, image and perception that made me think, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's probably some work here that, uh, it can be done to make things a little bit more uh, American, so to speak. In July 17, 96, TWA Flight 800 exploded after taking off from JFK in New York. And I remember this vividly. All on board were lost. Can you tell us what your first reaction was and talk about how the FBI eventually correctly determined what the explosion of the center field tank was the cause, that it was the cause? Yeah, I mean, like many of those uh, terrible events, it was uh, a catastrophic uh, loss of life. And I think our immediate reaction was that it was a explosive device on board the aircraft. Um, some of the other theories were ruled out fairly quickly, um, but the suddenness and the type of explosion at least indicated to us that there was a very good chance this was a improvised explosive device on the plane. Uh, also, the plane had a very uh, good safety history. So the fact that uh, you had such a catastrophic event uh, several minutes into the flight uh, 
that was our theory. And of course, we didn't publicize that or state that to anybody uh, because we hadn't done the investigation. And it was really an amazing uh, technical job that, uh, that the agents, working with a lot of other agencies, by the way, were able to do. They literally put the aircraft back together. So we took a hangar, empty hangar on Long Island, and then with repeated uh, excavations and dives and debris recovery, uh, which also included the recovery of human remains, which is always very emotional. Uh, they basically put the aircraft back together again, uh, about 92 or 93%, which was quite amazing. And that was the forensic uh, uh, analysis point. And because of the reconstruction and the ability to then sort of reverse engineer what had happened, they were able to rule out an explosive device and um, you know, attribute it to the, uh, the fuel tank explosion. But that took several, several months of uh, work. And you know, we wanted to be sure when we reached our conclusion because uh, too much was at stake uh, you know, to get it wrong at that point. The Unabomber case that spanned nearly 20, 20 years and had to be one of the most frustrating and difficult of cases. Could you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, it was a, a, a very uh, horrific uh, series of uh, bombings that uh, the individual um, engineered and executed and uh, very, very frustrating. The forensics that were recovered, uh, you know, didn't lead to a logical suspect or a location. And we didn't really have a clue uh, at the time of the latest bombing uh, who the person was and what the motivation was and what was gonna happen next. The bomber, if you remember, threatened he was gonna blow up an aircraft and his technical ability was such that uh, we were very, very uh, alarmed about that. And then we got a break in the case, you know, as they say, um, the, uh, the bomber, uh, Kaczynski it turned out to be his name, uh, wrote a manuscript which uh, he sent and demanded it be published. And if it was not published, he said he was gonna blow up an aircraft and do something else. So the, the manuscript went to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and um, it, was, it, it created a very interesting situation. Uh, we read the manuscript and the language, the vocabulary, the idioms, the syntax, it was very unique. And our theory was if somebody reads this manuscript, uh, they might be able to identify uh, who the writer was, the writer being the bomber. So this led to a very uh, ironic situation. We were asking the New York Times and the Washington Post to publish the manuscript. And initially they refused. And they refused on the basis that, uh, you know, they didn't want to be coerced uh, by a, uh, a terrorist. And we went back and forth. Uh, we finally persuaded... Uh, uh, Don Graham at the Washington Post uh, to publish it. And then both uh, journals shared, I think, the publishing and the cost. And very quickly after it was published, uh, we received a call from a man who said, uh, <clears throat> I read the manuscript. I know who the author is. Uh, he's my brother. And uh, I will tell you who he is, but you've got to promise me that uh, he won't be executed. And uh, that was the option that we had. And Attorney General and myself, other people weighed in and debated. We decided that uh, the person was dangerous enough and capable enough that we wanted to apprehend him. And that's how he was apprehended. The FBI is a legend, a legend, a legend in its own time. Uh, and, and it's been apolitical most of that time, but it's come under fire in the last four years from a president who has questioned the competence of the agency as well as the intelligence organizations. How do you feel about that criticism? Well, the Bureau is uh, apolitical. There's only one uh, political appointee in the organization, that's the director. Um, and yes, it has come under criticism and, and some of the criticism is valid. Uh, historically, uh, the Bureau, uh, as great as I think it is, and my experience in there was, uh, was very extraordinary. Uh, it, it, it makes mistakes. It was very slow to get involved uh, 
in the 60s with respect to organized crime and drugs because the director at the time didn't think that was a proper mission for the FBI. It was uh, very lax in uh, civil rights in enforcing the 14th Amendment of the Constitution on behalf of uh, millions of Americans. Uh, and it made mistakes more recently. I think some of the judgments that were made uh, by the leadership were, was <clears throat> were flawed and ill-advised and there were better ways and, and more uh, neutral ways to handle some of the issues than, uh, than, was, uh, than was actually decided. But again, I think it's made up of uh, thousands of people who are apolitical. They have a very uh, strong sense of uh, mission. Uh, they work on the facts. Uh, they make mistakes like everybody does, but I think uh, the culture and the caliber of the people who work there is very apolitical uh, and remains such. Uh, the fact that a temporary occupant of one of the leadership posts uh, makes mistakes or has bad judgment uh, doesn't really impact on the work of the Bureau. It does impact on its perception and its reputation, uh, which I think uh, now has to be addressed and has to be strengthened. My hat is off to you because you've devoted so much of your life to public affairs uh, and, and especially security. Um, I wonder if you could just talk for a second about, about your boys. Yeah, well, I mean, thank you, Bob. I've, I've been very, very fortunate. I spent, uh, you know, most of my adult career in either law enforcement or uh, I was privileged to uh, sit on the bench appointed by President Clinton to the Bureau, President Bush to the FBI. Uh, and, you know, thanks to my wife, Marilyn, I mean, I've, I've been able to really do things that uh, I love doing and things that were exciting and important to me. Uh, you know, in the meanwhile, we've got uh, we've got the six boys, which are now young men. We're very blessed and very very proud of them. Four of them uh, have been in the military service. Uh, one was a Navy SEAL. One was an Army Ranger. Uh, our uh, youngest uh, is in the Naval Academy. He's going to graduate. And uh, incidentally, today he just got his orders to report to Coronado for Naval Special Warfare training. Um, you know, their grandfather was a D-Day veteran. And uh, we grew up in a family, as I mentioned earlier, that was very uh, dedicated to, very aware of, and very committed to uh, public service. And I spend uh, the last few months, a lot of time down in the Naval Academy because the MIDs are trapped down there. They're quarantined as a lot of us have been. And, uh, you know, anybody who has any concerns about uh, the country and our future. I mean, all you have to do is spend an hour down there, see these young men and women, uh, and not just the ones in uniform, uh, all over our great country, these uh, young people and scientists, uh, you know, they, they find a vaccine in, uh, in record time for a, a terrible pandemic that's caused suffering. Um, anyway, I think there's a lot for us to be confident about and we shouldn't lose our sense of confidence and our sense of um, uh, exceptionalism, which I think this great country uh, is entitled to. And uh, we have to improve some things. Remember when the founders talked about the country, they called it an imperfect union. And I think today we, uh, we remain an imperfect union, but we rely on these uh, young midshipmen and all the other people uh, who will make the future uh, to make us more perfect. And we shouldn't be dismayed or we shouldn't lose our confidence uh, because we are imperfect. When it comes to hiring practices and uh, qualifications and talent that you look for, can you talk to us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, I mean, um, for the FBI, I mean, I could talk uh, just very uh, summarily about it. Um, you know, the young men and women that are recruited there are just uh, extraordinary. Um, most of them are in their mid-20s, have a second uh, post-baccalaureate degree, uh, come from jobs where they're making two, three times as much as we would pay them as a new FBI agent. Uh, what we're looking for in that uh, 
very important role is uh, integrity, uh, you know, dedication, uh, hard work, uh, the willingness to sacrifice, uh, not just the uh, time, but ultimately uh, your safety if that's uh, required. Uh, and just the uh, enthusiasm, uh, confidence. Uh, I've been in the private sector now for almost uh, 16 years and, you know, except for maybe the willingness to sacrifice yourself, uh, when we look at young lawyers and young uh, talent to interview and hire, you know, we want to have that uh, dedication, the integrity, the commitment, the enthusiasm, the energy. Uh, I think everybody uh, thrives on that. That's what makes us, makes us stronger. Thank you. And then with your practice today, could you speak to what you're uh, specializing in and where your offices are? Yes. So um, we work now, uh, it's uh, called Alex Partners, which is a large international uh, consulting company. We're in uh, London and New York, our headquarters here in New York City. Uh, we work in 14 countries overseas and we specialize in restructuring, uh, in business, uh, financial services, business improvement. Uh, my particular uh, responsibility there is in the investigations area and also uh, compliance. We perform a lot of compliance work for large uh, companies and we do very high-end sensitive investigations, uh, sometimes uh, public institutions uh, like Penn State, other times uh, large uh, multi uh, national corporations and um, we try to get the facts and then find out uh, how we can use those facts to make uh, changes improvement and uh, and move things forward and that leads into the the uh, final question with penn state and the investigation that was done could you just touch base a little bit about um, the processes that you went through during that time yeah, I mean, we were asked by the board to, uh, in effect, uh, find out what happened and what went wrong in terms of the governance and the leadership uh, at the university with respect to Sandusky, uh, how he could remain a trusted uh, employee and leader of the company uh, and campus for so long. So we put together a very strong team of about uh, 45 uh, investigators, some uh, former agents, former state police, forensic experts, IT experts. We interviewed uh, dozens and dozens of people. We went back and found uh, emails that uh, were no longer on active servers, but we were able to duplicate them and extract them. Uh, and then we made recommendations uh, to the board uh, so a situation like that would not uh, recur. And when Senator uh, Judge Mitchell came in to implement the recommendations, he actually uh, implemented all of them. So we felt like our, our work had been um, you know, sufficiently uh, used uh, by the people who were asking us to do the work. <laughs>